In the definition so far, I've made a strong effort to give general definitions. Vectors not just in R2 and R3, but at Rn. Addition and subtraction for arbitrary vectors that have n entries. I do this because a major goal of this course is to introduce higher dimensional geometry and the use the tools of linear algebra to explore those higher dimensions. In this video, I want to work through some examples of shapes that extend into higher dimensions. I do this as an exercise to build intuition about higher dimensions. Working in higher dimensions is a strange and marvelous thing, much more difficult than conventional geometry, simply because it can't be seen, can't even be visualized in the mind's eye. It is very valuable to build up some intuition here for what higher dimensional space is like, and that's what we're going to do. I want to start with circles and spheres. The unit circle is all points in R2, which are one unit of distance away from the origin. Algebraically, it has the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. It has a geometric shape and an algebraic description to access this shape, what I called a locus of an equation in calculus. Next is the sphere in R3. It has the same geometric definition. It is all points which are one unit of distance from the origin in R3. It also has an equation, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. The only change from the two-dimensional equation is the addition of the z-squared term. This gives me two ways to generalize the idea of the sphere. First, I can just continue with the geometric definition. The sphere in R4 is all points one unit of distance from the origin. Since distance is defined for all higher dimensions, as in the previous video, this works. I can't see these distances, but they exist. Then, to actually access this, I have equations. To go up one dimension, I just need to add a new squared variable to the equation. The sphere in R4 has equation w squared plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1, because w, x, y, and z are the coordinate variables for R4. I can do this in any dimension. The sphere in Rn has equation x1 squared plus x2 squared plus so on, all the way to xn squared equals 1. The squares of all the coordinates added together, the distance from the point to the origin is 1. With algebraic access, I can actually work with this sphere, talk about it. Consider these four vectors in R4. If I take the components of these vectors, square them and add them up, I get exactly 1. In the first, this is just 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 equals 1. In the second, the squares are all 1 thirds and adding up 3 thirds is 1. In the third, the denominators are all 12 after squaring, and the numbers are 4 plus 1 plus 4 plus 3 is 12 to give 12 over 12 or 1. And in the last, the squares are 49 over 74, plus 25 over 74, which is 74 over 74, which is 1. Via the algebra, I know that these are all points located on the sphere in R4. And this is pretty remarkable. I'm actually doing geometry in four dimensions. This is algebraic axis, but it is still not much intuition for what these higher dimensional spheres actually are and how they behave. However, I have another way I can try to build that intuition. Consider a sphere in R3 and take vertical slices of that sphere, as shown here. Each of these slices produces a cross section, which is a circle. If I do infinitely many of these slices, I can think of the sphere as a stack of circles, starting with smaller circles, growing to larger circles towards the middle of the sphere, and then shrinking again. The sphere in this concept is an infinite stack of circles of various sizes. You might recognize this from integrals for volume in calculus, where we use this kind of slicing to set up the integral, integrals to calculate volume. Well, I can think about the same way for the sphere in R4. I can't draw this, of course, but I can still think it. In R3, the slice of the sphere was a circle, one dimension lower. The same is true in higher dimensions. The slices of the sphere in R4 are normal spheres, starting small, growing towards the middle, and then shrinking again. The sphere in R4 can be thought of as an infinite stack of three-dimensional spheres, all right next to each other. Now, I can't visually imagine that. I can't put a whole three-dimensional sphere right next to another without squishing it. But in a higher dimension, I can do this. This is all a bit mind-boggling, but I hope by thinking through the idea, it gives you a bit of intuition about this four-dimensional sphere. Let me move on now to cubes. For the cube, I want to talk about higher dimensional versions by presenting a way to construct cubes. 
I'm going to start with one dimension where a cube, so to speak, is just a line segment. Then, to build a higher dimensional cube, I'm going to take two copies of the previous cube and connect the matching vertices. Therefore, to get the square, the cube in R2, I start with two line segments. Then I join them with new edges, matching vertex to matching vertex. That produces a square. And now I'll start with two squares, one in front and one behind. And if I match all the connecting vertices, I, this produces the ordinary cube. This gives a process. Duplicate the shape, connect the matching vertices. In this way, I can build cubes in any higher dimensions. Let me give you a very poor picture of how this looks in R4. The cube in R4 is called the Tesseract. I take two cubes and attach all the matching vertices. I get this mess of lines. Obviously, this is a poor picture since it is a two-dimensional collapsed version of the four-dimensional cube, but it does at least give some idea of what the cube is, what its vertices and edges are. Finally, I want to introduce yet another way of thinking about higher dimensional objects, this time using the diamond shape called the cross polytope in higher dimensions. I'll start with the diamond in R2. The way to construct these shapes is to have pairs of vertices, one for each dimension. So in R2, I have two pairs, which means four vertices. Then I attach all vertices except for those directly opposite. So here I get the four lines that produce a diamond. Now I go to the version in R3. In three dimensions, I have three pairs of vertices, one along each axis. I draw all of the edges except the edges that would connect vertices directly opposite each other. So there's no edge connecting the top and bottom vertex, for example. The result is a shape called the octahedron, and game players might recognize this as an eight-sided die. I can continue this into higher dimensions. In R4, I have eight vertices along four axes, and all the connections except vertices off opposite to each other, and so on. However, I want to do something different this time, another way of trying to see something of the higher dimensional structure. This time, I'm going to draw the vertices and edges, but collapse everything down to a flat graph. For the diamond, this is just the diamond. It is already flat. For the octahedron, I get rid of the drawing with perspective and evenly space all the vertices. This produces what is called a vertex graph. The three axes are all collapsed now, but I can still draw an X, a Y, and a Z axis through each pair of vertices. Then the vertex diagram of the four-dimensional cross polytope looks like this. It has eight vertices, and all possible edges through connect, except through connecting vertices are drawn. There are four axes, W, X, Y, and Z. This is a kind of shadow of the four-dimensional shape, but like other techniques in this video, it, it gives me an idea of the structure of the four-dimensional shape. One of the nice things about these vertex diagrams is they aren't that difficult to produce for many dimensions up the chain. Here's the vertex diagram of the five cross polytope, 10 vertices, all edges except those opposite, representing the shadow of a five-dimensional object. I can keep going. Here is the vertex diagram of the eight cross polytope. It's getting pretty complicated, eight different axes to imagine, but all the vertex and edge structure is really here, just flattened down. Finally, here is the vertex diagram of the 16 cross polytope. This really is a shadow, a heavily flattened version of a 16 dimensional diamond like shape. It is remarkable that I can get any idea of what a 16-dimensional shape looks like, and indeed, it is a very meager picture compared to the real thing, but it's something, and something beautiful at that. I hope the examples in this video have given you some sense about higher dimensional objects and our ability to actually think about them in some productive way. I'm not going to build on these examples in the course. We won't return to higher dimensional spheres and polytopes. But I encourage you to keep these examples in mind as we talk about transformations of 4, 5, and n-dimensional space throughout the course.